We're just about ready to start, so if you've got a spot where you can see, just so you know the tripods are here, we are live streaming this for fun. Mark has a bit of a obsession with tech and toys, so we have a webcam going and a live stream that's recording this for blogs and other future bits that we're putting together. Perfect. So thank you for choosing our session today. We'll uh, zip into some introductions. So my name is Mark Carbone. Um, I just finished a 35-year career with the Waterloo Region District School Board, so I've been enjoying uh, retirement for the last uh, few months. Um, but happy to stay involved in the EdTech space, which is certainly uh, one of my uh, passion areas. Um, I had a, an opportunity to work in a variety of different roles for the school board, but most recently as Chief Information Officer, so I was in charge of uh, everything to do with uh, IT in terms of administration, instructional technologies network and so on and it was certainly uh, my pleasure to have uh, Alison Bullock on, on staff with me so why don't you introduce yourself. I'm Alison Bullock. I am a former classroom teacher and now in the role of digital literacy support teacher. I'm one of a team of four and our job is tech mentoring and support for teachers all around our 102 elementary schools K-8 to on an on-demand very grassroots basis. Before that, I was 15 years in the classroom teaching uh, grade junior French immersion. So it was a really great career. I'm still loving being in Waterloo. So we flew in late last night aboard WestJet and caught the shuttle. So I'm sure it looks a lot different by daytime. <laughs> really glad to be here. If you have a device with you or something you can pop open to grab this link, we would like to ask you in words or a brief one word response or comment. What does the word, what does innovation mean to you? And think about your education context, experiences. Take a moment, just think about what that means to you. If for whatever reason that link does not work, please let me know. We are going to use your responses and turn them around into something. So the more participation we can get, great. We have one response. Oh, two. Excellent. There they come. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, yeah, okay, just while you're filling in the survey. We thought it would be a good idea to provide a little bit of a context for um, our session today. One of the things that we've been studying for quite a while in our school board, the Water Region District School Board, is this whole idea of what does innovation look like and um, poking at it from the perspective of if you were going to, say, define a culture of innovation, what does it look like, sound like, feel like? It starts to lead into other things around empowerment, flexibility, um, you know, the willingness to do things a little bit outside of the box and yeah, do it in the context of, of course, improving student learning, student achievement, um, all, all of those kinds of things, but doing it in a way that also involves the teacher as a learner. It's not just about the kids. And so the more we talked about this, in particular in digital spaces, where we're all aware of the rapid changes and trends that are happening now with desktop to mobile, uh, bring your own technology, what does collaboration really look like in a truly digital uh, classroom? 
not to say only digital, but what does that look like? What does that mean for teachers? How do you think about teaching differently? How do you try to reach kids in different ways? What do all those things mean? And so that's something that we've been actively exploring. And one of the kickoff points for us was about seven years ago, and in terms of technology, of course, that seems like ancient uh, times ago because all the technology changed since we began this idea of the Futures Forum project. But this was an important building block, and so we wanted to provide just a little bit of an idea for you of what's involved in this project because it is really the springboard for the rest of our presentation. So the Futures Forum project started with um, a group of senior staff, myself included, and we all um, enrolled in a course through Powerful Learning Practice. And the idea was that we would be involved in a year-long job embedded PD. And so if you kind of mentally map the clock back, that was right around the time that social media was becoming a little bit more open, a little bit more commonplace for educators to share. People were starting to blog beyond just business blogs. And people were starting to think about social networks in ways that um, might have specific advantages for uh, education. So we went through this year-long process, and at the end, we had to design an action research project. And as it turns out, the Futures Forum project, which is still alive today in the board in, in a certain format, that was our action research project. So we set out um, to actually explore pushing the boundaries on teaching in secondary schools. And where we landed was um, really this idea on the left, one, two, three, four. We, we chose very specifically an area that needed disruption um, in a nice way um, because we know that student scores were low. We, we know that there was a need to change practice to look at different tool sets and really to try and engage learners in a different way. So after a lot of research, discussion groups, focus groups involving community partners, businesses, parents, and so on, where we landed was this one, two, three, four solution. So uh, put yourself in a grade 10 context here. And so we had one teacher who would teach the same group of students for a half day, effectively two semester periods, not the one-to-one -one regular timetable schedule. The one teacher covered the content of three courses. English, careers, and civics. So a full credit plus two half credits. The beauty of packaging this up was that you could look at the strands and weave the course material together in a brand new way. It wasn't isolated, it wasn't siloed. So you would look at how do we use media strands from English in the careers program and so on. And then we came up with this idea of the four innings. All learning principles should be based around anytime, anywhere, anyone, anything learning. Learning isn't just restricted to the classroom space. Draw a dotted line back to the social media connections. We had asked that we have core elements, and the teachers themselves were empowered to actually design the curriculum. And where we started was one teacher in each of seven different secondary schools. So we started much bigger than the typical one school, one classroom, let's see what happens. We started it with a much bigger picture. And we also started with a broader look at things. We didn't want this to be something that was held in one school. We wanted to start conversations in multiple schools. So this was our approach. So core elements that we gave the teachers to design the curriculum around was moving from paper writing to online writing. And that, of course, offers opportunity for editing, um, if you think of what's possible now with Google Docs in terms of seeing the, the history of documents, making suggestions, collaboration, changes your teaching practice. Um, we found the kids responded well to the idea of they're creating their own content, it's not just about using content that's given to them. And so they had inquiry-based projects where uh, they had to create online newspaper publications. Um, we also offered uh, some student choice where uh, the students in those seven classrooms had to do a novel study, but it could be with any one of the seven teachers, not just the teacher in their school. And we used uh, a video conferencing system that we had at the time, Adobe Connect, as a way of interfacing the students and their remote teacher together. So it was pushing the idea of blended learning, but in, in kind of a controlled way. And we also had as a requirement that we wanted teachers to explore social media use in the classroom. 
and what did that look like? But again, you have to think about the context of the time. We were one of the first school boards to open up access to Facebook. And so we had uh, teachers with um, <coughs> fan pages in those days and they could keep it separate from their personal profiles, but it became an instructional space and it became a place where kids would ask questions and students would help other students and it started these online sort of informal dialogues, which was really interesting because what came out of it was students that would not ask a question in class now had a voice, they had a space, and we found that made a huge difference. I followed all of those teachers that were using the particular Facebook approach, and what you could see was, I'd get a ping whenever a student posted on one of those pages. What you could see was that students were learning from 5 a.m. until 1 in the morning, but they were fitting their learning into the time that they had, so you could tell when well, this person often posts after 8.30. I wonder if they had a club that they attended or sports or maybe they had a job, but now they're doing their schoolwork. Other kids would work really early in the morning, but then there was this culture of students helping students. So we know that played a positive role. We also um, did a lot of work with Twitter um, in, in this classroom space. Um, one of the things that still resonates today was the teachers came up with an idea called TED Talk Fridays. <coughs> and so they would collaborate and agree on a particular TED Talk relevant to the curriculum. And they would show that in their class. But the students would reflect on what did they learn, what did they think were the powerful ideas, what questions did they have, what observations did they have, and they shared them publicly on Twitter. And so we had a board. Um, hashtag that sort of blended all of that learning together and again it became a safe space and a way to role model the power of using social media in the, in the classrooms. Those, those things still live on today. In terms of what did we learn, we learned some really interesting things. We actually partnered with a third party company to do an independent evaluation of this approach to teaching and to take four years of research and just put it into two or three sentences these were the key things that we learned. Students responded very well to learning in this new environment rather than traditional sort of paper-based, rows, traditional classroom method. We saw it come out um, in parent, student, and teacher feedback that they noticed a difference in how students responded to the learning. Students' um, opinions, their efficacy scores went up a significant amount. We know in student assessments, um, those students scored two to five percent higher by being taught in this kind of blended, online, uh, collaborative manner. And those became things that you simply can't ignore, especially when the results were reproduced over multiple schools, multiple teachers, multiple student groupings uh, on a four-year basis. And so with that in mind, as our big experiment from six, seven years ago, um, that's the piece that sort of brings us forward into today. And so the series of things that we're going to talk about now are really building on the successes of what we learned from the Futures Forum project. So I'm going to take over and talk to you about a collaboration project I was part of four years ago next month. This was a museum day, and at the time I was teaching grade four, and part of the social studies curriculum in Ontario is medieval times, but with a revision, it now includes ancient civilizations and medieval and the Middle Ages. So 5,000 years of history in the six weeks you mash in in the spring and go, oh, I have to get through that. So I, teaching it also in French as part of partial French immersion in our board, the challenge was to make it accessible to students, engaging, <coughs> and I also am a big fan of tech integration and thought, how can we stir this up get them working in groups and make some sort of meaningful end product. And the idea was an interactive history museum. So you can just see through these snapshots here, there are students working on various exhibits. The Colosseum itself was made out of several cereal boxes and plywood. Like we actually used four foot sheets of plywood, hammer nails, hot glue, paint. First time I started tapping a hammer in the room, they're looking at me like, game on, all right. <laughs> That's some real tools in here. You'll notice a QR code on there as well. So we did some tech integration in terms of the interpretation of history and the content wasn't blatant in reading and text in traditional formats. The students were required to put their explanations about why this building is significant for modern history and humans now 
They had to do it in French and English. Another group also added Arabic, because they speak it at home. And they put their little QR codes in different colors in and around. Some of them wore costumes that day. And one of the, one of the girls, you'll see her in the next photo, made herself a tinfoil gladiator helmet and the night was awesome. So she brought that in. Coupled with this <coughs> approach, we partnered with a grade 10 class at a high school, not in walking distance, with whom we had to communicate virtually. So Mr. Baronski, who is the grade 10 teacher, is a Futures Forums teacher. So he's doing this multi-subject civics English project. Part of his delivery is contribution to community and being a good mentor and helper in, this, in the community. So these 15-year-old and 16-year-old kids were mentors for mine across virtual space. The grade 10's job was to create and design a package so grade 4 would understand what does a four-week project look like. Pro week 1, you're going to get your research, check in with your teacher. Week 2, start getting your materials together. So the grade 10's had to dissect the grade 4 curriculum and their teacher was quite militant saying, if you don't do this right, they're going to fail social studies and it's on you. So they got really uptight. But the finished product was mind-blowing. So each group of three students in grade four had two or three grade tens matched with them. So they made a small cluster group. They got personal Google sites, websites, documents named for them with your step-by-step. -step. They had funny little things like, don't be late, your teacher will eat you, and they had little graphics. So they, they had the grade, these nine-year-olds in mind customizing and preparing these personal documents to walk them through a successful project. We did do a Hangout. I brought an example of Google Hangout. So what you'll see are my grade fours explaining to their partners in the corner here what their great pyramid was looking like so far and what they had done. And during the Hangouts, they were asking for their expert opinion. So these, Andrew and I weren't sure whether grade 10 was gonna look at us and go, really? Crafting and glue? Like, what do you want me to say here? But you can, it's hard to see in this corner, but the look on their faces, these 16 year old boys, is just this look of, are you kidding me? That thing's huge, this is awesome. And they kind of look at each other and they're laughing. Mine are saying, what do you think for the floor? So we're just gonna see a little piece of this as we go. Um, we're gonna take you on a tour of the pyramid. So, um, inside we're still working on it, but right now we've got some hieroglyphics up. Um, we're going to be um, putting this sarcophagus in. We're going to be holding this sarcophagus in. There's the bottom and the top. Um, we, painting it, we painted it in metallic gold. Um, also, there's the, there's the mummy that we're going to use. Um, so that's going to be inside, and they're and they're we're going to have people that are carrying the sarcophagus in. That's good. That's good. Um, so you just hear them like, "Wow, that's good." <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> what they were asking them to do then is just sort of consult and say, "Was this historically accurate? Was this something that was high quality for your visitors who were coming to the museum?" And the, the key part, the crux for me, was Museum Day. The day we actually had our exhibit, the grade tens came by bus and joined us in person, which was just mind blowing. So there we are in our school library. That's Mr. Borowski and me doing a giant selfie. And there's my little gladiator, Yevon. So what they had to do was come in, be part of their group. And what we noticed with this collaboration, this new learning, was the, the bonds that the kids formed. So these all gawky teens kind of wander in and the first thing they do goes where's mine and they found their group and they just kind of <coughs> they hung out and they stood there and they're talking so Andrew and I say well, go learn go see the other kids and they do it they walk around so like, oh, them to play with stuff and then they come right back again I guess what's mine and so that bond was really fantastic there we had um, a mosque we had three different castles, we had two versions of the pyramids, so the one that you saw was at the moment of burial for the pharaoh, and the other was a modern version with archaeologists opening it up, so they had the big open-sided thing. So social studies became a community action, it became social interaction, positive use of social media, 
we're still talking about this four years later. I never thought that we'd still be talking about this. Andrew gets asked all the time, how do you find somebody to do this with? And are we realize to just start talking to people. When you're in places like this, just talk and share and network. You never know who's going to know somebody. Or you yourself might say, oh, I, I totally do that. And you hook up and use social media and stay connected. Another one that was modeled on our Andrews and mine was the first one, the first high school, grade school collaboration that happened in our board that we know of on that scale. So we're really quite proud of that. The second one was an iteration done two years ago, I believe now, with a grade three class, Scott McKenzie's class, and Mr. Jones at a local Kitchener High School. And they built bat houses as part of science and nature preservation and wood shop. So they got together and came up with a design. So the kids came to the shop with both grade 10 and grade 12. And they helped them build and paint these bat houses so that the grade threes can put them up and learn about habitat preservation and species and put them all together. So they took the bus and went in and the grade 12s went back and forth. And again, the response from the older students was the most surprising of all. It was that feeling of, I got to be the teacher, I got to help someone and it felt really good. Rather than that resistance to, oh, there are kids this big, I feel like I'm babysitting and not getting paid. Mm -hmm. So the response was very positive and we hope that more collaborations will happen. This next example um, goes back to, takes us back to secondary school. Um, and it revolves around um, the grade 11, 3 UU um, English course. And the teacher here is uh, Jamie Rayburn Weir, who's a, a wonderful um, teacher and I would say instructional innovator um, in the Waterloo Region District School Board. And this particular project happened because her students in the course of conversation in the class were concerned about education changing fast enough to face <coughs> with the reality the world is changing around them. And how could we um, maybe influence what, what happens? We're concerned. What boiled out of it was, we want to talk to people that are interested in changing education. And so they took that on as a class collaborative project. So Jamie got in touch with me and we put some ideas together on how this might unfold. And the, the final um, uh, product ended up being very interesting. Um, the, the students decided they wanted to actually, again, focus on relationships. They wanted to talk to people. And so uh, through some research and, and some connections that Jamie and I had, we actually put together an online panel discussion for them. Uh, so the students got to choose uh, the, the final sort of uh, subset of, of panelists, if you would. And I was pleased to uh, participate on the panel. We also had two representatives from the Ontario Ministry of Education uh, participated, Karen Buechler and Brenda Sherry. Uh, we had a retired director from one of the Ontario school boards. Uh, we had Dean Chereski, who many of you may know from the, the Twitter world, and we also had Donna Fry from Thunder Bay. And so the way this played out um, on the actual day was we did this live. It was done with a Google Hangout, so it was kind of a cross-Canada feel to it. The students had researched all of the panelists. They looked to see about their digital footprint. Were they writing about education? How were they showing publicly that they were innovators or thinking about educational change? So they researched these folks on the panel. Which ones had blogs? Which ones didn't? Which ones asked questions on social media spaces? Which ones didn't? And so they began to uh, form an opinion about um, the panelists. And through that process then, the students actually generated a script of questions to be asked in preparation for the day. They divided up into work teams um, for the actual event. Uh, so some students were interacting with the online panel and, and moderating the, the script and the responses. Other students were running a live Twitter chat in the background. And we had contacted a number of schools, again, to make this a real world experience for them so that they're interacting with a known and unknown audience. And, um, and so it worked out to be a wonderful thing. I'm not going to play the video now just for the sake of time because we did record the whole thing. But if you have a chance to look at this later, um, at the moment I've actually started it to play, Dean Chereski is making an, a really important point to the students. That one of the things that's changed 
is that so many things are libraries now. He said, we don't have to be in physical spaces just to learn. Not like we did. Schools and libraries had sort of control over the learning spaces. That isn't the way it is in today's world. We have social media, so he was challenging us. Can you think of Twitter as a library? Do you know what hashtags to go to to find out information, to ask questions, to see where things are being debated? Can you think of YouTube as a library? Can you find people on there that have YouTube channels with relevant content to what you're studying? How do you take that world and blend it together with traditional research? Some interesting elements come there. So his challenge question to the back to the students was, how can we promote more of this? And so it was a very interesting discussion. I um, hats off to Jamie for leading the project and to the students for doing a wonderful job at coordinating and developing the, the questions and, and managing the social media stream. But just to show the impact, um, this project ended up being documented by the Ontario Ministry of Education and is now featured on their website as a, a spotlight project that reflects uh, student voice, forward thinking, technology enabled learning, all of those things kind of <coughs> coming together into one interesting project. This video, and I know we're halfway through our time already, uh, is very worthwhile watching. It's only about eight or nine minutes long, but there's some interesting things in there and lots of interviews with the students. Again, remembering it's their learning. And what can we do to facilitate richer learning experiences? What year was that? Um, that was within the last two years. I think the actual event was maybe in the fall and then the ministry um, interviews and sessions happened in the spring. Mm -hmm. We do have links to this slideshow. If you came in a little bit later and it was not showing, we will put it back on at the end so you can take it with you. Everything is accessible. Even all the links, they're still all live and active. We do things like mystery Google Hangouts or mystery Hangouts. I don't know, anybody familiar with that? We have 20 questions. So uh, Google, Skype actually started this as a mystery Skype. There's a, a page on Twitter. You can look up mystery Skype on Twitter. There's a network of teachers who have thrown their names in the hat and said, yeah, I'm in, I'll play. And someone generated a database of all these people. So it's your Skype handle, in this case, it was Google Hangout, where you are, what you teach, and you, you would pick somebody off the list knowing that someone, you put yourself there knowing somebody might tap you and say, well, I'm in Wisconsin, do you want to play? So the teachers know ahead of time where you are because you need to arrange with time zones and whatnot. But you put your classes on a hangout or a virtual connection and you play 20 questions trying to figure out where the other class is. So again, you have to use good etiquette, use your social media skills, research skills, teamwork skills. Not everybody can be staring in the camera going, are you, are you someplace cold? That's how we play in grade school. So the, I laughed the first time somebody asked our class, are you in the northern hemisphere? And all the kids went, <laughs> to me. <laughs> no, to self. Did you put that into the curriculum? <laughs> so what you're looking at right here is a group of students, student teachers, excuse me, with their mentor on Manitoulin Island in Lake Huron, Ontario. Is that right? Third of May? I just heard that is. It's pretty terrible. And we have a class in Kitchener Waterloo. You can see sort of rough in the corner there where their screen is. So the teachers were learning how students would on the front lines, use this technology, play this game, and they had to guess where each other was. So they would ask a question and talk and so on. I think it's maybe over here. Are you near London? Are we near London? Somebody else has Google Maps on the computer in the background, and they're running an answer back to the front of the room. No. Off they go, the next question. So you take turns of play, and ultimately you build. I did this with a class in North Carolina at a Chinese immersion school. Who knew? so great we ended up staying friends with them and teaching them virtually how to sing jingle bells in french and at christmas time they sang to us their music teacher took the time to learn it phonetically bless her heart she did not speak french but she learned it phonetically the kids got toques and scarves on and sang jingle bells to us in french as a christmas gift all because we made that one connection using mystery hangouts great for creating a network as well Heather Teismeyer is one of a major 
voice on Twitter. If you're not really into Twitter and using it to create a personal learning network, a professional network, please start. Turn the page today and get on. Start following people and building. It'll, it will change the way you do things. I might just uh, add one, yeah. one comment to yeah. that. Well, it was really interesting to see because this was uh, an example that really kind of uh, was put together fairly quickly. Um, but what was interesting to see was because we didn't tell the students how to respond to this situation and so they started making decisions about well who would talk to the folks at the <coughs> another group started working on well let's generate a list of questions to ask the other group but maybe we need to prioritize which are the best questions to ask and in what sequence then there was the research group that Allison referred to where they're receiving the information from the other end and checking their answers now, Alice and I were both online as kind of the secret agent helpers, so we were um, making sure the teachers at both ends that yes, that answer is correct, or no, you better challenge the kids on that one, and that kind of thing. So we had kind of a behind the scenes role. But it was really interesting to see, again, this was something that turned out to be about relationships, about yes. collaboration, about going deeper, about finding information and validating it. It was more than just, here it is. And so it was a very uh, rich experience and the bonus is for um, the teachers that were on Manitoulin Island, they are now teaching other teachers how to do this in the school, but they loved learning with the kids because this was also their first Mystery Google Hangout. And so it was a great chance for staff and students to be learning together and I was really impressed with the level of questions. So they started to ask, well are you um, east of the Ontario Manitoba border. Hmm. Well, now there's a point to research and depending and we, we had limited them to yes, no answer questions. So there was no well, could you clarify that and that sort of thing. And you had to say yes or no. And well were you north of the four oh one highway in Ontario and you know, where were you? And so back and forth. And in the end, I think it took a few more than twenty questions, but both groups did guess each other's locations, so everybody had a, a positive ending. Yeah. Just as a technical point, the back chat, to clarify, was happening on a Twitter chat, direct messages back and forth. So Heather and Mark and I all follow each other. So if, it, if someone someone asked, are you in Ontario? And the kids said, no, we quickly, uh, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the technical of how we did that. So we each had phones nearby saying, just just correcting and getting people back on track. Question? Yeah, I, I think that speaks to uh, my question, how did you, what was your role in coordinating the activities of the students? I'm yeah. very sure of that. Just gently guiding them back into accuracy. I mean, nobody misled anybody on purpose. It was a really good mental note for the teachers for what geography needed to be taught really quickly. Uh, this example um, is really an interesting one. This. Um, teacher Tanya Bumstead is um, teaching at Vista Hills. It's one of the new schools in, in Waterloo. And uh, she shared uh, in, a, in a recent board event her experience at looking at the idea of a STEM-focused approach to delivering curriculum, uh, but again in this idea of the collaborative connective classroom. And uh, in it, uh, I'm actually going to play just two little video clips for you because it's better to hear her describe it uh, in her own words and I've, you'll see on the slide there I've highlighted the little bits that I'll, I'll play for you. Um, but in this video Tanya describes um, the connections between finding people online, how to engage your class, and more importantly what the pluses and minuses were the first time and then what she did in year two. So this is really her talking about her own professional learning journey of doing something that's collaborative and connected for the classroom. So, because I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher. So, last summer I had um, I noticed a tweet that kind of came out, and the tweet came out about a teacher who was looking to start a learning hub. And if anybody, well, if you've ever met me, I'm the tip person who steps in with two feet and goes, I'll do it! And I stepped right in and said, sure, I'll do it. And I, I did it. Um, it was an experience that was quite unique. So what happened was we connected with a bunch of teachers from around the world. We had teachers from Hawaii, teachers from Nashville, teachers from Texas, and teachers from Barrie, Ontario. 
And what we did is we met online and we talked through Walker, we talked through Google Docs, and we created this online learning hub for students just by connecting on our PLM. So this year I decided, eh, the learning hub worked okay last year, but what didn't work was I was connected with a bunch of teachers who were language teachers. And I teach, at the time I was teaching science only. And so we were creating challenges for our students uh, based on language criteria. So they were creating poetry, which sometimes doesn't necessarily work with what we're doing in science, right? So it didn't really quite work. So this year I thought, well, I'm going to use my PLN and I'm going to put myself out there and I'm going to see who I can get to kind of join my little bandwagon. So I tweeted out, I don't know, multiple times throughout the summer. And that's the tricky thing is that sometimes it depends when you tweet it out, depends on the time of day, depends on who's following you. And I really did a push that summer to say, I'm going to follow every teacher out there that's involved in this STEM idea. So I look for math teachers around the world, I look for science teachers around the world, and anybody involved in technology that's interested. Started following them. And then I put out my tweet. I would like to create a STEM learning hub. If you're interested, let me know. And that's how it started. So the way it worked is we actually got a few schools to step on board. So if you want to just put that for me there. Thank you. So here at Vista Hills, we started it. And then I had a teacher from New York who actually is a STEM coordinator in New York. And he said to me, Tanya, I'm on board. I have three schools involved. We're going to get involved with it. Let's do it. So that summer, we opened up this doc and we started putting ideas. What would our STEM learning hub look like? So we were putting ideas of how would we organize the classes, how we organize the groups, what are the groups going to do when they get together, and what's that going to look like? We also had Lincoln Heights jump in, so not too far away, but John Pry over at Lincoln Heights said, yeah, this sounds fabulous, I'm in. So we signed her up, and it all started coming together. So the first thing that I try to really, it's really hard when you're making connections for people outside the Waterloo region, because we have goals that are I'll just pause it there. Hopefully that's enough of a teaser that you might like to listen to the rest of it. But Tanya goes on to talk then about, well, what's the format in which these students will work? How will they communicate? So basically, I think they ended up with four schools connected. So the students were in groups of four, one child from each school. And they were assigned sort of a school blog into which they did uh, all of their communicating and planning. Each group worked through a real world problem to solve and end up with a presentation back to the classroom. But for those kids, they've now got real relationships with students that are in other parts of the world. And if you uh, listen to the second clip, the learning, um, you know, I asked Tanya, would you do this again? You learned in year one, you had a better experience in year two. And hands down, she said, this is becoming part of the standard way that I'll approach that part of the curriculum because it makes it such a richer learning experience than just using the textbook. Part of innovating and changing we have found is getting away from receiving content and having downloaded content to you. You read the textbook, here's one way to interpret things. If we talk about content creation, and student interpretations of new learning and collaborating. <coughs> TED Ed is a great vessel for students to create content and demonstrate learning with creativity, with inspiration for topics they love to talk about. The TED organization, this is the same people who do TEDx and TED clubs, they have a <coughs> website here, ed.ted.com. Ed must be his brother. And these are the three teachers within Waterloo Region who are currently working on TED Ed clubs in three different schools, of three or four? Four. Four schools this year. And students are putting together their inspired TED Talks following the meticulous rules and guidelines from TED about presentation, eye contact, delivery, good syntax, all that stuff. And they're going to have a celebration and come together at Vista Hills Again, that popular school where lots of great things are happening. This is just a screenshot from their YouTube channel, from TED Ed Clubs, where students have been allowed to upload and share. I believe through TED Ed Clubs, they filter through and pick one. So they have to sort of vote on which one represents their club the best. 
and that gets uploaded to here. So TED has been going on within our in our board for three or four years now in small pockets, and now it's coming to a greater, wider audience and group that's collaborating. So we're still going. Next month, in a couple weeks, we will have our four schools coming in for TED Ed, TED Ed Youth. There will be tweets happening if you're interested in following. If you just look for Mark or me or WRDSB somewhere in the tweets, we are still exploring and sharing with TED clubs across schools. And just as a, a way of, um, I don't even think I told you this yet on the, the, the trip up, but we've just gotten permission to actually live stream the event and also broadcast on internet radio. And so we'll have such a nice real world um, audience uh, for these students. So we'll definitely uh, tweet out the information of how to join um, the event. Um, we'll tweet it into the CNIE uh, 2017 yeah, hashtag. Great. Yes? And I, I don't want to get two questions too early, but I work at a college and we really struggle with using some of these tools because of uh, concerns around ownership of data. Like in BC, we, 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 a lot of these, unless like the data is collected and kept in Canada, we have a real time working with. Have, do you guys consider that? Because like Google Docs is great, but I can't use my have my students use it because Google stores everything in the United States. So that's uh, such an important question um, and area to to consider. Of course, in Ontario, we're very fortunate that about I think five years ago. Um, there were a number of stakeholder groups, um, which included the government, the Ontario Privacy Commissioner, um, OASBO, which is the Ontario Association of School Board Officials. So think about uh, sort of uh, the committees that are reflective of all of an education center, uh, departments, transportation, IT, privacy, and so on. Uh, as well as um, the, the province's OSAPAC committee, um, which is one of my other hats. I chair that group, and we make recommendations to the Ministry of Education around what tools to license for use in publicly funded Ontario schools. At that point in time, um, those four groups banded together and we actually negotiated with Microsoft and with Google to come up with a, a privacy agreement that everybody would agree to, including the vendors. And so we have a signed off agreement, uh, for example, that says students can use Office 365 and Microsoft has provided us with a way to uh, sort of roll that deployment out in a K-12 school board scenario that meets that agreed to privacy guideline and Google did the same thing. And so now, for example, in Ontario, there's uh, two million students and I think over 60% of them have access to at least one of those environments. And many school boards are actually recognizing the importance of diversity of tools and even the idea that Instead of saying, here, use this tool, let the kids choose which tool is best for them. Why should we tell them what tools? And so many school boards are actually putting both of those environments uh, into place. So we're very fortunate that, that that legwork was done, but we're totally in the clear as far as uh, using those kinds of things. So anything stored in a school board Google Apps environment, I mean, that content can populate a website, it can store videos, it can be public or private. I mean, you have all of those controls. And the essence of what's in those agreements is both of those vendors agree that they will not do any data mining uh, on those school spaces. Um, and it's been a benefit for the school board. I mean, my goodness, both vendors have said, we don't charge for storage space. Whatever you need, just go ahead and use it. And I know um, in Waterloo, um, we have a dashboard, we can pull it up and I know that, for example, 65% of our staff and students use Google Apps, Google Classroom, they use those tools every day. And there's terabytes of information that's stored in the cloud, but it's all there safely and in accordance with that agreement. So, yeah, great question. question. Thank you. Last example, and one of my favorites, PubPD. It's something that has evolved grassroots and it's I think it started over a late spring summer sort of idea that teachers wanted to stay together keep talking so pub PD the hashtag came about and the idea is that you volunteer as a teacher to run one organize one so you, basically you make a Google form and say who wants to come I need to reserve a table for so many people and that's it but then maple syrup edu proudly Canadian puts you on the map there's two in Ottawa and so on, lots down here where we are. And people can go and find their closest pub. And 
and they can sign up. They can come and have a drink, have a meal, chat. And so it's actually a Twitter chat going on while you sit in person and meet new people. The first couple times were really weird because there were 12 people around the table all doing this and not talking. So the organizers got really great feedback around, this is a different social dynamic, it's really bizarre. So they've actually given us prompts. <laughs> Put your device down, talk to a human. Oh, okay. So then I want to talk about assessment or whatever the, the theme is. And they'll put the questions out. For example, what are some great resources to support hacking the classroom? You talk about it at your table in person. If you wish, you tweet your answer and put the PubPD hashtag. You put the Twitter handle of the person you're speaking with. You can put photos. And at the end of the night, the end of the hour, and there's an example right here. Somebody's got their PubPD up and their wings and their pint. That's exactly what it looks like. At the end of the hour, the organizing group will run a draw for a Google Summit anywhere in Ontario or somewhere and say, or actually anywhere you want, you can win your admission just by having you answer the Google form and get the feedback in. So it has evolved and changed. We don't go every month. Some people don't go at all. And a lot of people follow from home. So you don't have to feel compelled to go out in that social sphere. Many people find it overwhelming. It's too much content. Some people describe a Twitter chat as 200 strangers walking into a room, you shut the door, and everybody shouts to a random corner at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it can feel like to somebody who's really not the introverts. There are such things as social media introverts, even like human introverts. This can be difficult, but it's yet another way to explore. It will change, it will evolve, but PubPD is currently a way to collaborate and share what's going on in boards. Right now it's educators, but people who are interested in education have stake are also welcome to follow along. So that's been another great example of innovation and change. Certainly, the ones that I've attended, and uh, you know, for a while last year, they were kind of standardized on the last Thursday of the month, yeah. and they would put out a blast on Twitter, who wants to host one, and so you would get five or six of these happening across the country. And so you have this nice chance to sit down with some friends and colleagues, have some dinner, uh, but also connect in a, in a broader context. And, uh, it's been very successful, yes. and I mean, that's, I mean, you control your own agenda in terms of how much food you eat, and it's, it's just free conversation. It's sort of bringing the water cooler idea into a new format that's sort of kind of socially fun and a little different, and you know, and the stories are now captured. There's a tool called Storify where you can take a series of tweets from a particular time frame, post them online. So if you look. There are the storified versions of the various PubPD uh, conversations, and Alice and I have been to most of them. I think that have happened in mm -hmm. our area. One Sorry. of them was Mark and me. That was it. Mm -hmm. Person. So we had a great. It was chat. amazing <laughs> conversation. <laughs> though. It was just oh, it was so focused. Question. So there will be a half dozen of these going on at one time. Yes. Yeah. Um, in a variety of locations. So only people that would live somewhere near that particular location would get involved then. Oh, they, I mean, they do it from it's home, but to in terms of people that go to the pubs, they're well, probably something. a long way away. If there are only four or five of them, there's not much chance there's going to be one near you. There might not. It depends. There okay. might not be that one. And then you just jump in. But I'm not sure. If you want to do one, you could host one and right. get six people to if go. If you're feeling disgruntled that your <laughs> city's not represented, then you jump on and say to maplesyrupedu.com and say, hey, I will do one, and I'll pick this pub. And it's just simply a matter of calling your favorite watering hole and booking a table and saying, are you okay with this? Do you have free Wi-Fi? Do you have a good network? Because we need that. And you just go from there. Now, earlier, we asked you to, oh, that's classy. <laughs> I did nothing. There it is. Sorry. We that asked you worse. to answer the survey, what innovation means to you. And your answers. I copied and pasted from my Google responses into a tool called Word It Out, which is better than Wordle because Wordle doesn't like Wi-Fi networks apparently. So looking at the, at the screen, doing creativity, all these different words that you can put here, how would you see some of these examples? How can this approach, the very things we've talked about, be used in your own context? I know we're not all K-12. to we have university, we have high school, we've got all kinds of different contexts of learning and growth in the room. And with somebody nearby, or share with a larger group, did anything come to mind 
not just questions, but we welcome questions about how some of these things might be inserted or morphed and changed to create innovative and different changing, edge pushing learning for you. Yes? Um, well, a couple of things you mentioned uh, actually uh, makes meaning to me with regards to instructional design uh, because I work with the faculty to redevelop or redesign their courses and I'm thinking of probably into introducing some of these ideas to them to make their courses more engaging and active learning oriented um, in order to meet the needs of the students. Um, this is not, for instance, like the mystery Google Hangout is to me is a good idea. It's a new thing to me and I want to try this out with some of right. the if they will buy into that. And then the third ed clubs, yeah. that's one one thing also I'd like to try or push forward to uh, to the faculty. Um, just a couple of things that you guys have mentioned, I want to Great. sell that out to faculty that's members. Terrific. And it might be just one word that you heard. It might be the idea that you can completely turn and make work for your students' age level, for your language that you speak or teach. It's not necessarily a replication of something that you've seen. Is there anything that you kind of tweak? Our goal is that you walk away with one thing, one inspirational idea for innovation in education in your context, and now is a chance to sort of let it stew. And you'll probably find by Friday at 1 o'clock your brain is scrambled egg, completely overwhelmed. But if you can take one thing, we're curious what that might be. I'm going to go back to the, the slides so you can see our I might just add one comment to the idea of thinking about taking something to your own context. One of the things that we learned in the Futures Forum project was, um, ironically, one of the things that made that project successful was the fact that the seven teachers were in seven schools, and so, in essence, they were isolated. And so they were forced to collaborate, <coughs> they were forced to change how they planned, how they, how they worked with other teachers. You couldn't just go to the staff room, you couldn't just chat with the teacher across the hall while the kids were on lunch break and so on. Um, you really had to change your practice just in terms of how you thought about uh, preparing. And so in an odd way, I don't think any of us when we designed the project would have expected that isolation would have played a key ingredient in how things unfolded, but the truth of the matter, it is. And if you start to fast forward, one of the things we wanted to learn out of that project was, are we getting some traction? Are people noticing? Are people coming up to the Futures Forum teacher and asking questions? So as you start to fast forward now, went from seven teachers to adding more schools to in the morning and in the afternoon and over a period of about four schools, we were kind of maxed out just in terms of how many true sections of that particular subject combination you could run. Um, but then people started to talk about exactly the thing we had always hoped for. Does it have to be those three subjects? No. What might this look like with math and science or this and that? It doesn't really matter. It's the idea of taking these things and making something new. The worst thing that happened was some people that watched said, I really like this. Could I just have your binder and I'll just start doing whatever you're doing? And that was a giant light bulb moment for us because what we realized was that's exactly what we didn't want. Why? Because you went through the journey of changing your practice, collaborating with the teachers, inter integrating different strategies in your classroom. It's not a binder situation. So we kind of went back to the drawing table around this ban the binder idea and thought, how do we keep the program fresh? So we actually differentiated the teachers. The group that planned the first couple of years, we let them run. That's your version of Futures Forum. The new people in, design your own version. It doesn't have to be their version. And so we actually teased it all apart and made it more personal to those teachers. And it's still a goal is to kind of keep the binder idea out of the mix. I think you wanted to say something or ask a question? Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of interesting how you said uh, geographical isolation uh, to help spur some of this on, where um, I work at a university with six different colleges, College of Dentistry, College of Medicine, but they're all in the biomedical sciences, and you can be very isolated in the middle of a campus. So I see Great point. one of the uh, concepts that I wrote down is um, 
course that I will be teaching uh, in the fall is also being taught by people in the other colleges. So I think I could uh, try and make those connected, invite them through Google Hangout to watch the presentations that are going on in my classroom and maybe they could evaluate them. There's, you know, some sure, jump to the idea. It's sort of they expand the boundaries of what that classroom really is. It's not just there. So thank you for that. Thank you. One thing I noticed, we did not plan this. This just happened with your answers. But innovation is doing something way better. Those are the four that stuck out to me right away. I'm like, yeah, let's so do Yes. This map, this creates a map so that the responses that are most common are bigger? Or did you do that? No, it took the it words took the and did a random artistic the, layout. No, it, doesn't it lay it out according to more people respond with these words? Something is yes, it's bigger. So doing something way better words that were used the more ones that in are the repeated more often. Right. Yeah. Okay. The, the tool is worded out. Right. Dot com, and you can just do it on a free web, flip and change, take a screenshot, and you can change the style. And if you don't like it, just say regenerate, and it'll give you a better font, background, anything like that. So thank you for your participation with that discussion. Um, <laughs> I'll jump in. Okay. Um, one of the things that is of real personal interest to me is um, always looking ahead. And I, I don't mean that in a way that's not to value the moment that we have here together now. But I always think one of the most important things ever is what you do next. And so I guess that's our, our challenge to you based on the conversation today, the things that have been shared <coughs> is to maybe do a personal reflection on what's your next, who will you talk to, who will you collaborate with, what's one thing that you might try differently in your own personal journey and working with students, no matter what, what ages uh, that they are. Um, and I believe in that so much, I actually have it on the tagline uh, of my email, what's your next, and I wrote a little blog post that goes with that, because to me, that's what takes this moment that we've shared together and makes some action out of it. And we each have an action, we each have a sphere of influence, um, and we can influence ourselves. So um, thank you for choosing our session today. We, we hope that um, in some way that we've poked your thinking and uh, stimulated some ideas. Uh, Allison and myself are more than happy to uh, keep in touch uh, beyond the conference. Um, we're both active on, on Twitter, and we both uh, are regular blog posters. You're regular. Okay. <laughs> um, and once again, for those of you that joined late, this session has been video recorded and also live streamed, and we'll put um, oh. the um, address. <laughs> uh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, we'll actually post the, back the video of today's session. We'll post it on YouTube and link it into the blog. You can find, find that among other resources as well. If you'd like a photo, take it now because I'm going to change it. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? Okay. Go back to the. There we are. So it's actually a personal. It's a bit.ly, CNIE 2017, Allison underscore Mark.